listen, I love that for you. Um, me, on the other hand, I just discovered today that apparently I'm not a mom. I've just never had a big backyard. Look at them out there. They have left me alone for hours. I'm so patient. <laughs> Turns out you can be a really patient and cool mom when your kids aren't up your all day. They're called momfluencers. They tell us what to buy, what to wear, how to pose, usually looking perfect in every photo or video, but that isn't always reality. We're talking to the author of a new book, Momfluenced, inside the maddening picture-perfect world of mommy influencer culture. Sarah Peterson joins us. Thanks for being with Hi, Sarah. us. Sarah. Hi, thanks for having me. I think we had a couple of examples of different kind of momfluencers on social media. You know, the kind that are sharing everything and being open books, the kind that are presenting a picture-perfect image. Either way, it, it's a lot of pressure on moms today, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's a constant influx of information, um, a constant barrage of the best way to feed your kids, clothe your kids, educate your kids. Um, the best way to look and feel as a mother. And it's all, you know, available for purchase usually. But why do mothers care? Why do you care what some momfluencer is saying? Why not just go live your life and do the best you can? <laughs> I mean, it's really, really hard in the age of social media that we all live in. Um, as soon as, you know, a woman becomes pregnant and Googles anti-nausea teas, um, <laughs> her, the algorithms on Instagram will start feeding her momfluencer content. Oh. Um, and early motherhood is just such an anxious time for everyone that I think we're driven to find, you know, the best way to mother from whatever avenue is available. And social media is that avenue for a lot of people. And this isn't a new thing, though. When you think back on it, it's uh, you talk about how, uh, you know, Betty Crocker was the, you know, this image of the, you know, the Betty Crocker cookbook. You had to be the best mom by making all these great recipes. So talk about the history of this idea. Yeah. I mean, in America, we've always sold mothers on this mythology of ideal motherhood. And it's often rooted in whiteness, in class, um, and other socioeconomic indicators that aren't attainable or accessible for many folks. Um, so yeah, I think this myth of the mother who can do everything without any external support also, you know, impacts our policies in America for mothers. Um, we don't get a lot of support because we're presumed to be able to do it all of ourselves. But momfluencers, I would imagine, are often maybe getting some money to pitch a product. I mean, I'm wondering what psychologists say about the people who feel the need to listen to these people, and is their advice different? For mothers? I think, you know, your mileage will really vary. If you're going into momfluencer content feeling exhausted, overworked, overwhelmed, feeling insecure about your own mothering, you might have a negative, you know, psychological experience. You might feel worse about your mothering choices. You might, you know, look at somebody who seems to be doing it all and loving every second of it mm -hmm. and feel like, you know, you're a bad mom. Um, if you're looking specifically for like nursery inspiration, you know, to decorate your kid's room, that is a fairly innocuous way to use momfluencer culture. So I really think, you know, users need to ask themselves, like, what am I trying to get from this? Is it impacting me in a negative or a positive way? What about the privacy issues? So many people not afraid to share pictures of their children and document every aspect of their child's life. Yeah, it's a huge concern. Um, I often think of child actors. Um, you know, how much consent can a five-year-old have, for example? How much meaningful consent can they really give to, you know, starring in three movies before they're 10? I think it's really the same thinking about child influencers. We are starting to see laws protecting them and um, in financial ways, having to put a certain amount of income earned from social media um, into trusts for kids. But I think the privacy and consent issue is still really ethically thorny. Well, for more, you can follow Sarah on social media and also on her Substack page. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you so much for having me.